All right. Uh, my name is Michael King, a plein air and studio oil painter. I'm also the founder of Arfa Wines. Thank you so much for being here. But before we start, I'd just like to give you a little bit of information about Arfa Wines. Arfa Wines focuses on the artist's artistic development and growth by providing exercises, inspiration, instruction, guidance, discussion, and feedback all in one place. We try to do that with our skill development exercises, our weekly open office hours, our monthly challenges, our monthly critiques, inspirational interviews, just like this one, and our upcoming master classes. You can find more about us at artfulminds.ca, or you can come and look at our community at community.artfulminds.ca. All right, and with that, so our inspirational discussion today is with Jessica Gale. Uh, she's a British contemporary painter whose practice involves both plein air and studio painting. She investigates and manipulates the dynamics of what is in front of her, the shape, the light, in the negative space, whether through form or through color. Welcome, Jess. Thank you so much for being part of this Artful Minds interview. Thank you for inviting me. I feel very honored to be here. Thank you. That's so kind of you. I'm going to scroll through a selection of your works, and if you could just do your own introduction, that'd be fantastic. My name is Jessica Gale, and I am an artist based in the UK. I'm currently in London, but I divide my time between London and Dorset, which is a county just west of London. Um, I was born in the north of England in Yorkshire but when I was a few months old my family we, we all moved to Hong Kong. My father was a doctor in the army, British army and uh, so I had a very transient childhood. I lived in all sorts of places, Hong Kong, Cyprus, Germany, all the kind of standard British army postings. Um, I didn't have a particularly art-filled childhood. Um, I come from a very musical family, so I um, we all played lots of musical instruments. Um, I got music scholarships to my school, so music was really my main focus when I was growing up. Um, and um, I left school and I went to go live in Paris for a year. Um, I've done so many jobs before I started painting. Uh, I was a nanny in Paris. Um, I got a bilingual job working in London for a big American bank. Then my husband's job took us to go and live in Singapore. So I lived in Singapore for about 10 years. I had a business designing children's clothes. Um, and then everything changed and we were sent to Amsterdam in the Netherlands in 2011. Um, I didn't know anyone there really. I didn't have a job and I thought, okay, well maybe this is the time to try something different. So I heard about a painting class around the corner from where I lived. And it was just a small class with eight people in there and the fantastic teacher, Hans Verwood, who was just really bohemian and fun. And he, um, he, I didn't know anything. I literally had never picked up a brush. I mean, I dabbled a bit at school, but that was it. So um, I, you know, every Wednesday I'd go along and we'd listen to really cool music and drink coffee and paint. And I was painting really different stuff then. I was, it was acrylic and it was very, very tight. Um, I was painting animals, horses and things like that. And then suddenly my husband said, right, we've got to move to London. So a year later it was like, oh no, I'm going to leave this amazing experience so we moved to London and I thought okay this is this is it I'm gonna I'm gonna go to art school so I signed up to Heatherly School of Fine Art which is based in Chelsea um, it's an old very traditional school it was set up in 1845 um, lots of famous artists went there Millet, Sickert, uh, Franz Klein um, to name a few so I thought okay well that sounds like it might be quite a good school to go to uh, it was very traditional art school, um, very much focused on drawing, drawing from observation, painting from observation. So lots of life drawing, lots of still life. Um, and I really learned the sort of nuts and bolts of how to make a painting, how oil painting works, very much focused on oil. I was terrified of oil when I first started because I was only used to acrylic, which of course dries so fast. And, um, so I kind of, I didn't do a diploma, you can do a diploma there, but I sort of created my own foundation there and I just took all these different classes throughout, well basically over five years. I learned a bit of printmaking, portraiture, and while I was doing that I was sort of absorbing all this information about all these different artists and I just, I just felt like a kid in a sweet shop, I was just absorbing everything, I was just loving it. 
Um, so I kind of learned lots of things. Um, you know, I learned about abstraction. I found that really interesting. I was really scared of it initially. I didn't really understand abstract art, but uh, something that really interests me. And it's, um, currently I am going through quite a big abstract phase. Um, so yeah, so I did that and then I thought, okay, well, I'm going to try this on my own. And thankfully people were buying my paintings. So I had a few exhibitions uh, with friends and I had my first solo exhibition this summer um, in Dorset, which went quite well. And uh, now I'm not really working towards anything. I'm just enjoying painting. I've got a few commissions going on, but um, I'm just, yeah, enjoying just the freedom of just painting for my own happiness. That's awesome. Thank you very much for that. Now with your education that you took, you were exposed to a lot of things like printmaking, drawing, I'm sure, you, and everything was from life. How important yeah. do you think being exposed to all those different types of creative aspects has helped push you to where you are right now in terms of painting? Um, I think with, well, certainly looking at printmaking, because I mean, I, I'm a really messy painter. I'm really kind of just, I'm, I'm very immediate. And printmaking, I found quite hard because you've got to be quite tidy and clean. But I learned that the accidents that happen in printmaking can be turned to advantage. And so I think that has weirdly informed my work because I like the accidents that happen in my paintings and I'm really happy to leave them because I think they, they add interest and a bit of dynamism. I think it's really good to learn from life. I think it's really important to hone your drawing skills because if you want to break the rules I think you've got to learn them first so I think really looking how to draw and how to create a composition and, and make a composition really I think composition really is the most important part of a painting I realize and so I learned a lot about that but then I also learned that you don't have to be a slave to what's in front of you and you can change things and not be too hung up of, on perfection. So that's what I learned, definitely. Gotcha. You're more abstract now than representational. Is that how you start to see all your subjects now when you look at a landscape or a still life? You pretty much just see them all in abstract shapes? No, I definitely see them as they are, but I like to, to imagine them what they're like. I mean, when I, I, get, I go out with my sketchbook and I definitely draw in what I see, but when I take my sketchbooks back to my studio, that's when I start playing around with shapes and brush marks and colour and not worrying too much. I'm, the most important, as I said, is, is the composition. So I will manipulate lines and things and make things flat. I went to a Milton Avery exhibition quite recently here in London and he really fascinated me, he, how he's got these really sort of solid blocks. I like the kind of tension between, with quasi abstraction, whether it's realism or, you know, it's just hovering between the two, I quite like that. But no, I don't, I don't see things things as abstract. I guess I'm looking at things as they are, but I'm already thinking about how I'm going to put them on a page. That's a good way to describe it. I just want to share this here, and it's about your deconstructing of landscapes. And what I find interesting about all this is these are kind of a series of landscapes, but, but they all stem from one page. So here comes a little video of you just having some <laughs> marks on a page, cutting them out, folding them and creating a series of landscapes. And then after you cut them out, do you rework them so they're more indicative of what you want them to be or you just kind of leave them? No, I leave elements of them. But so they started, that started in last summer doing those to during one of the many lockdowns that we had here. I wanted to, I was looking into concertina sketchbooks. I like the idea of making my own concertina sketchbook and taking it out walk with me. This was how I originally thought I was going to do this, but then it became something completely different. I would take the concertina sketchbook on my walk and I planned to kind of sort of draw my walk on each page. And then I got it home, I thought, oh no, I'm not really sure. I really think that's very good. And I didn't do a particularly good job. So then I cut them all up into individual pieces of paper, but I wanted them all to still speak to each other and still say the same story, but be different. So what I did was I cut them all up, put them on a wall. And I just, from my memory, I took little snapshots of elements of my walk because I walk this walk very regularly. So I know what it is. 
And I was each page is a different element of my walk, but very quick. I wanted it to come across as a very quick uh, snapshot with just shapes and colours. So that's how it started. And it, they're really fun to do. I really, really like doing them. They're, they're, they're hard work, but I, I like doing them. I can imagine. I mean, just the, um, the freedom to start with something at an abstract base, and then you can find something in it that represents kind of what you want to paint at that yes. time, right? I mean, that must be just, it's a little more freeing than just having a white piece of paper or a white canvas, right? So that's why I started so my first, so I always paint them on Cardi paper, which is an uh, Indian uh, handmade paper. I don't know whether you can buy it in Canada, but I I get it here. It's quite ready, very easy to get hold of. And it's very stiff. You get different weights, but I get the really stiff one. It's really rough. And so you get these really interesting marks. So I get this piece of paper, I make all the marks with pastel and charcoal and gouache, and I just flick stuff all over the place, scratching into it. I let that dry. Then I fold it all up and I cut my pieces of paper out. And I just, I like to, I like to leave elements of that first ground, that first stage of mark making. I like to have those elements showing through to add a bit of, excitement i suppose a bit of diamond dynamism oh for sure that's that's really cool so you mentioned mark making i mean with your pieces now like you said they're very abstract but how important is mark making to your paintings right now i think it's really important i think it's important in all paintings and i sort of mentioned earlier i, I come from this quite musical background and i i look at paint like a piece of music and you listen to a piece of music, it's all the same volume and all the same note and all the same everything. It's pretty boring. But if you've got different instruments and different volumes, a bit of drums, a bit of whatever, it just becomes more interesting. So I think with a painting, it's the same thing or a drawing. Different marks, different things to keep you interested and it's not bland. So yeah, I, 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 and that's a really important part of my painting is, is that initial mark making at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. You're the first artist I've heard that compared it to music and being all of, all one the same kind of note, the same tone is is quite boring. But when you mix it up, you have a you have a beautiful song and it can translate that in the painting. I think that's a great analogy. I, I really like that. Thank you. I often think of I can see so much between music and painting. I talk about it a lot. I just you know color is a harmony. Um, I think yeah. it's, you can keep, keep going with the analogy. It just works all the time, I think. Yeah, no, okay, so speaking of colors though, do you have a set palette that you always seem to work from or is it kind of just, you're inspired by what you're seeing or what you want to interpret so you put on the colors just for that painting? I do tend to have a set palette. Then I I do go for it sometimes with random colors. So I my sort of standard palette is usually ultramarine, cobalt, Cerulean, yellow ochre, burnt sienna, burnt umber, cadmium red, and then white. And then I'll kind of get some really random colour, like straight out of the tube, like bright pink or some kind of magenta or turquoise. And I love kind of throwing those in to add accents or just to kind of lighten things up a bit. Like in the summer, I'll probably use less yellow ochre and use maybe a bit more lemon yellow, sort of brighter brighter colors yeah it depends on my mood really <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds about right i mean i think a lot of artists work like that as well i mean i have my set palette as well but sometimes you know you just need that one color that yeah you really need right i quite like using a restricted palette sometimes to really change things up so just literally using three colors but you know rather than using cadmium red i might use a burnt sienna for the red and then a sort of Payne's gray for the blue and I don't know, maybe a sort of raw, raw sienna or something for the yellow, and then just do a whole painting on that and see see how that turns out. I quite like giving myself a bit of a challenge with that sometimes. Yeah, and a challenge it is. Do you find it more difficult? Because I know when I start bringing out just three arbitrary colors or, you know, within the red, yellow, blue kind of spectrum, I find it so different from my regular palette that I get confused and it takes me a while to kind of adapt. Absolutely. I, I remember I was painting on the west coast of Scotland a few years ago and I used, I'd never really used it, but I used Tharlow Blue. Oh, jeez. I made everything look like it was in the Caribbean and tried 
West Coast was gone. It's nothing like the like Caribbean. So I'm, ne- I'm never touching that color again. I didn't like it at all. <laughs> oh my God, that's so funny. So polar opposite of what Scotland represents, right? Yeah, totally the opposite. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. I'm going to share my screen again here if I can bring it up. And so this is a painting called Summer Hedgerows. And you seem to put a lot of detail into this, but with another painting called November Fields, which is this one, there is all just broad brushstrokes. So I'd love to hear your view as to why this is and why there's such a huge difference between the two. I Well, it was the subject matter, really. November Fields was me really just looking out. It was November, obviously, which is a really dark... Well, we're right now in November, dark, dang, usually pretty wet. And I did paint this in my studio, but I'd done some initial paintings outside. And it was just one of those really wet days and you just you just want to get everything down the page as quickly as possible so you can get back to your studio. And it just worked really it was one of those paintings that just worked really well. It behaved. I always think paintings, you know, they either behave or they don't. And that one just worked really fast. And so I could have worked into it and put a lot more detail into it but I liked the way it was just like that whereas hedgerows was I don't know it called for a bit more detail I think the the hedgerows around us are absolutely at that time of year burgeoning with just the most amazing wildflowers and basically they're weeds but they're all really beautiful and I wanted to celebrate that so that's why I put the detail in Okay, that, I mean, that's perfect. Thank you. It, it, it was one of those ones that didn't necessarily behave, so. <laughs> <laughs> what you said there about a painting behaving, I think that's absolutely true. And also, knowing when to stop. I mean, there's sometimes when I've been out painting and I, I just stop, put it away, and I came back and I look at it. It's just an amazing painting compared to if I was just to keep on going and, and, and ruin it. So I think that's an important aspect to let people know about. Absolutely. Well, I think it's the sort of classic problem for most artists, isn't it? When is a painting finished? And it's just, I don't know, there isn't an answer. I think you just have to go with your gut. And it's really, I mean, I've definitely overpainted paintings in the past. I think I've kind of learned now that you get to the point when you think you could be there, leave it, just park it and then go back to it in a couple of days. Or sometimes I do the trick where you just look at it in a mirror, looking at it with fresh eyes. Because sometimes, you know, you're just looking at a painting for so long that you can't actually see it anymore. But knowing when it's finished is a really hard one. But I'm, I, I think that's really what I do is I just, I stop when I think it's nearly done and then go back to it in a couple of days. Gotcha. So it's just making sure you listen to your instinct of thinking that it's almost done instead of just puttering around on it right yeah oh yeah. god it's kind of when i know when i'm dabbing the dib dib dab i think okay stop go and for a walk or go and do something completely different absolutely that's um, a really good piece of advice so let's talk about your studio work because obviously your studio work was going to involve more photos but do they also involve your all your plein air studies and sketches when you're out in the field and they kind of all just come together uh, into your studio piece? Yeah, so I'm I'm not much of an old plein air painter. I, I don't like the faff. I, there's a lot of stuff I have to take with me and carrying. And so what I go out with a canvas bag and my sketchbook and, you know, some willow charcoal, compressed charcoal and my pastels and maybe some brushes and a bit of water. And I'll just do kind of loose sketches, but I also take photographs. I, I'm i really interested in photography and I think iPhones take pretty good pictures in terms of, I, I like to use them for establishing composition. I don't use them to copy color because I think iPhones distort color. Um, and that's actually something that I learned at Heatherly's um, with phones were a big, no, 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 don't pay for phones. But then after I'd been there a few years, my teacher, Danny Cummings, said, yeah, we say that at the beginning, but actually when when you get become to a certain standard, you can use them, it's okay, um, because you learn not to be a slave to it. So anyway, so I take my sketches back and my phone, and I just use both of those to start on paintings. And going back to the happy accidents, you know, when you're out in the field, you know, the wind's blowing, the pages are flapping, and you've got certain things happen and actually think, oh, actually, I, I quite like that. So that's, again, a really nice way to inform my work, keeping it loose, abstract, um, if that's what I want. I like your, your, your anecdote with your instructor saying, I mean, we tell you that at the beginning, 
but really uh, you can work from photos at the beginning you shouldn't because then you're not becoming a slave to them and of the color of their values etc um it sounds like you're at a really good art school then yeah it was a really really good art school during our little talk beforehand you mentioned you're relatively new to painting and i think in your um introduction you mentioned you know late in life you went to school but how long ago was that so that was so i was in my mid 40s so i'm in my mid 50s now so it was about 10 yeah 10 or 11 years ago i i just found it and i just i'm so glad that i did because i was i mean i was happy doing whatever i was doing but i didn't realize there was this whole other element to to my life that i hadn't discovered yet so yeah see so that was in 2012 i started painting properly and um yeah i just i'm so happy i found it yeah, it's kind of funny how you know you love painting kind of immediately when you first started, don't you? It was like an epiphany. It really was. It was like, oh my God, this is what it is. Oh my God, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. So let's get into what inspires you to paint in your works. You've talked about going outside and just sketching in the immediate, you know, kind of the sense and the feel out there and the happy accidents. But is that really what you're going for? Kind of the, the sense of the space, the aspect of the day, uh, the light of the space. Can you talk about that a little bit? Definitely. Some of my paintings, I like feeling space. It's more about an emotion. It's not my paint, none of my paintings really have a narrative. I, I don't, I mean, if they have a narrative, you know, I'm happy about that if there's something that comes up. What inspires me is just the way the light lands on a hedge or, or the way a, a path winds up a hill. It's just how I feel when I see it. And that's all. I don't paint famous landmarks or, you know, specific valleys or certain hills. I'll just see something the way, I, I, I just see a composition and I think, Think, okay that's what I want to paint and it's just it's just something that grabs me straight away and I think okay that I'm, I want to paint that they all come from an emotion really for me and you, and you talk about the composition but how many times have you repainted a space or a location because the time of day has really changed the sense of feeling of that place yes no you're you're right my parents lived in Wales for a long time in fact my mom has only just moved moved away from there a few weeks ago but they lived there for 35 years on the West Coast near this absolutely amazing beach, which I have painted so many times. And you're right, it's the light is different every single time. And I was always drawn to it because it was this always usually really wet and these amazing clouds that would be coming over from Ireland and stormy, stormy skies. But sometimes it'd be really sunny and windy and... So yeah, the same place, but it can evoke different feelings. And I do paint the same scene sometimes over and over again because of that. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's important for people to know too when they're when they're out exploring, looking for locations to paint or just exploring locations to take photos to paint from. Yeah. You know, don't don't spend five minutes in that location, right? Spend the entire morning, spend the entire afternoon, a little bit of the evening and take photos every half hour. That's going to be more inspiring, I think, to an artist than just one or two and going home to the studio, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And go back to it the next day or the next week or something. And just, Absolutely. Or, or the, the following season. You know, I've painted a hedgerow in a field at all the different seasons exactly the same angle because it just it looks different every time you know the fields you know they've got things growing in them and then they're plowed up and all the leaves come off the trees and it's just it's it's different each time i i really love that and you know i suppose you know all the famous painters did that turner did it and constable did it go back to the same subject i don't think an artist really understands the importance of that until they do it right yeah i agree I agree totally. So we're halfway through the interview right now. So if you want to ask Jess a question, please do. We have one waiting in the chat and it says, when you are painting in a more abstract form, do you see yourself as moving backwards to see a broader brushstroke approach or moving closer in to see a very different format? What? So while I'm painting it, I definitely stand back. That's something I learned at art school actually was to to really stand back from your work. When I first started painting back in Amsterdam, I was, you know, one centimetre from my canvas with tiny little brushes and holding it like this. And I remember my art teacher, Danny, making for whole terms, tying a, um, a brush to a, a long stick. And <laughs> I had to paint like that for the whole term. And that really made, you know, it really taught me a lot that you can make really interesting marks 
with a really big brush and you don't have to be really, really precise. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that paintings kind of came from that, I suppose, just sort of not being too precious about detail and yeah. Yeah, exactly. How- I, I love that you say that because I used to be a very tight painter and the way I got out of that was I did exactly that. I, I started by taping my hand to the end of the brush, but I found that wasn't enough. So I added a stick to it. And so I was about two and a half feet away from the canvas and I was doing the exact same as, as you. And it, it changed the way I paint because I can appreciate a brushstroke more in terms Absolutely. of lay it down and leave it instead of just going over it all the time. So Absolutely. for those artists out there looking to paint more loosely, that's a fantastic way to go about it. Uh, and also painting with your non-dominant hand. That's the other really good Yeah, that's a, that's a real weird feeling though. Yeah, yeah. I'm really good at so- my left hand but I do try and do that sometimes to loosen up we learned a little bit how do you work but when you work on your larger pieces do you work on it until completion I mean you do seem to know when to step away and come back to it later or do you kind of have a lot on the go do you have five or six paintings on the go where you'll work on them all at the same time Um, it depends on if I'm kind of like working towards a show and I've got a series of things that are all kind of related under a sort of umbrella of a theme I do tend to work on those at the same time, as many as I can. I mean, maybe two or three, so not a lot, because I quite like to have that connection, A, actually using the same palette, you know, colours on my palettes. They can speak to each other. They're different paintings, but they are connected through through the same sort of colours. If I'm working on one commission, then I'll be working, I will 100% focus on that one commission until I've finished it, and I can't focus on anything else um, because I, I'm worried that the other things I'm painting will start to affect the painting I'm, I'm working on. So I can only work on one commission at a time. Um, yeah, that makes sense. And then at least, yeah, you have 100% of your focus on that one piece too. Yeah. And I, I mean, sometimes I, like those multiple pieces that I, I do, those deconstructed, obviously I paint those all at the same time and they're all stuck on a wall together and they're all painted and adjusted all along the same time. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. So you put, actually put them all on a wall and work on them all at the same time. Yes. Oh, that's yes. fascinating. See, I'm going to have to try that. I've never done something like that before. That's just amazing. Yeah. So you've kind of got the same energy that's going into the whole thing. So I'll get a bit of charcoal and I'll make a mark on one and then I'll go across and I'll stand back and I'll make another. Same with, you know, I'll dip my brush into a particular color on my palette and I'll just make marks. So it's all going back to the music thing. They're like verses of a song in the same song, but they're different. And I, so if I paint them together, but separate, it seems to work. Yeah, I love that. That's a great idea. Man, you're giving me so many ideas here. This is amazing. Thank you. Um, Another question that came in. uh, Would you mind sharing how you organize a painting day? Do you have a routine? I look at the weather. That's the most important thing. See whether it's going to be rainy or windy. And if it's going to be really terrible, then I might defer the next day. But I just get my boots on and just put a few things in my bag. I'll, I like, I mean, where I am in Dorset, I'm, I've am i got really lovely things really close to me. So I don't even have to get in my car. I can just walk. I do like to paint urban landscape as well so in London I'll you know get in my car maybe and drive to a different part of the Thames I live very close to the Thames so I'll go to maybe a very different up to the east end but I yeah I tend to just pack light I don't take all my paints and all the tarps and I just I just don't I don't like doing that I'll I'll take watercolors with me if I want to take paint with me and just a really nice sketchbook and some charcoal and pastel and some fixative mm. so I can sp- so it's more about just capturing that moment in time and then using that later on for for more inspiration or for a larger piece correct yes absolutely yeah gotcha. I'll take all that and then that, that will inform my paintings. Thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, what do you observe is the impact if the accessibility of artists such as yourself via social media, such as Instagram, uh, it's a degree of contact with a real artist, which previously didn't exist. I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but I think that social media has definitely opened up, you know, to communicate with the people who are looking at your paintings. I mean, I think before social media, you you know, you had to sell your work through gallery in order to sell. But now I can communicate with, I mean, I do sell on Instagram. I, I sell quite a bit. I think it's incredibly powerful, Instagram, social media generally. So I like that. I mean, it, I don't really see any negative. I think maybe the only negative, but you can sort of say this about generally all social media, is it's very easy to compare yourself too much to other artists. 
and I think that's quite dangerous. I don't like, you know, you start thinking, oh, someone's selling more or they've got more followers. I, blah, I don't, I don't like any of that. But I think it is really, it's a, it's a very powerful tool it, used in the right way. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. As long as you stay out of that mindset that, oh, this person's doing better than me. I'm not really that good of an artist. Just forget that. Just use it for inspiration and for communication, right? Uh, another question here. It sounds like you instinctively know when you see something to paint, um, like you're walking and there's a moment that inspires you. Is that true? Yeah. Uh, yes, it is. I mean, I'll just be, again, it's always about composition. I don't know why. I always just see, you know, I mean, where I am, I, I endorse it. There's a lot of tracks. I walk a lot on tracks and there are a lot of paths that cross fields. And I just see that as a fantastic composition. You know, you've got, I mean, you know, when you're making a painting, you always want a vertical and you always want to get horizontal and diagonal. And I see that constantly in everything I see. So, yeah, I just, I mean, it's, it's not always perfect. Sometimes I go out and I just think, oh, I can't, I don't, I can't see anything and I'm not going to paint today. And, but sometimes I do. And it's usually just a gut feeling. I just think, oh, God, no, that looks amazing. I want to paint that. It's, yes. it's good to hear you have bad days as well. It's good to hear. Ah, uh, God, definitely. That's all part of it. <laughs> the experience is, is enriching, though, I find as well. Yeah, sometimes you go out there specifically to go and you need to go and find something to paint and you don't find it. But it does stay with you, whatever you see. And But that's okay. It doesn't matter if you don't see something. Or, or what you paint is rubbish. That's all part of it as well. You know? <laughs> it does it's, happen. It, it's quite humbling when that happens. It's kind of nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no. Uh, another question here. You mentioned looking at your painting in the mirror. Do you ever turn a canvas upside down to assess how it's going? Yes, definitely. I learned that from my tutor, Sarah J. Moon at Heatherly. So when you get to a painting, when you've got a painting and it's just not working, turn it down. Definitely, yeah, the mirror thing or turning it upside down. And invariably it works. So I think you just, you get so used to seeing something constantly looking at it all the time. You actually don't see it for what it is. So turning it upside down definitely ramps things up and changes things. Yeah. And so sometimes when a painting really isn't working, I'll turn it upside down and I'll just get some really big brush and dip it in something really random and disrupt it. I think disrupting things really, really helps a painting. And, and I think that works really well for your more abstract style instead of uh, representational style, because it might be a little more scary to do something like that and on a representational piece, right? I've done that with a, with representational paintings when they're just not working and I've got to do something to make it. I'm, I think what happens, you can be working on a painting and it's almost there, but not right. And you just, you don't know what it is that is going to make it right. And so you're terrified of ruining what you've done right so you're just not getting anywhere you're just treading water so sometimes what I've done and it, I mean it's scary to do it but I've yeah just gone I've made a really random mark across it and suddenly I've I've kind of destroyed it but it's I'm back on the treadmill again I'm back on the thing and I can carry on without wow. worry Oh, I'm going to have to try that next time I'm stuck. <laughs> Get past that that block that you, need, you can't do anything to it, right? So here's a comment, not really a question, but it's a wonderful comment. Um, I am very fortunate to have an original Jess landscape. I can hear her lovely voice and energy of each brushstroke, as well as feel the air and smell the scents and the vibrancy of color and clever composition. Oh. I think that's a, <laughs> that's a wonderful quote for your website. Yeah, that is. I'm going to remember that one. Oh. <laughs> Uh, okay, would you consider organizing a workshop in the coming years? Yeah, I've looked into it. I have actually started teaching a little bit now. I like going on workshops myself. I think it's really important to keep pushing yourself. And uh, so I, I, I can see the importance of doing it. And I really like sharing what I've learned. I really enjoy talking to people and it's hopefully inspiring people because I... I'm so excited that I found this thing myself that I like to share that with people. So yeah, I have taught a little bit, but yeah, I'm yeah maybe workshop. I yeah maybe. <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned that as well because when I started teaching, I found it a, a real muse, and it sounds like you get the same kind of energy from it, and it's uh, inspired my own work and moving forward. Definitely, it's just nice to see other people. You know, I've I've had absolute beginners who've come to me, and their first lesson, they're really, really scared about making a mistake, and it's just really nice to tell them it doesn't matter. You know, 
it's just painting and you know your first mistake is might be the best thing that you've done it so yeah it's, I've, I've, I've really enjoyed teaching actually I, I like that aspect that's a that's a wonderful way to think about it so just to carry on I don't know if you upscale your paintings if you can make larger versions of your paintings but if you do what is your process for that it's not very, so we did learn at Heatherly's at my art school, we learned transcription, how to upscale paintings, you know, with all the grid line, the thing. We did learn to do that with famous, I remember doing it with Francis Bacon paintings, and I find that really fascinating. But to be honest, I'm not that technical now. I, I think sometimes some paintings just don't work being upscaled, so I just leave them. But if I do, it's just by eye. I don't do have any very technical way of doing it but I do find that mostly a small painting just doesn't work big why not just I'll just leave it small um, yeah, it has more, has more impact that way doesn't it yeah and I think that the exciting thing in a small painting is maybe the immediacy because it is small and then suddenly it all looks a bit labored when it's on a really big canvas so it just doesn't work Oh, for sure. I could see that being more so for your style too, because it's very big brushstroke here, another brushstroke here, kind of fine line here. How would you incorporate that into a larger four by four painting, right? I mean, you just couldn't get that same freshness, I would think. Yeah, you don't get the same immediacy. It's all a little bit too considered. And I just don't want my paintings to look like that. I want them to look like they've just happened. Yeah. Um, so I, and I've, I've discovered the hard way. <laughs> Trying to make a small painting work and it just in a big scale, it just doesn't really. So I just leave them small. Yeah, nothing beats experience, right? Uh, absolutely, yeah. So so here's a difficult question for you. What does it take to be an artist, do you think? The struggles, the discomfort, the difficulties, the highs, the lows? I think it's all of those things. I think you've just got to take the rough with the smooth. What it takes to be an artist? I think you've got to be quite brave. I think you have to accept that art is really subjective and you can't please everybody you've just got to accept that you're you can't you're not gonna not everyone's gonna love your painting and you've got to get over that and I think you know when you do have moments when you feel like you've been rejected when you've applied for various competitions or whatever and you haven't got through you've just got to well that's life and get back on the horse and keep going really but I think yeah you just gotta be brave I think that's how you get through it yeah, for sure. Now, related question though, I don't know if you've uh, tried to enter any competitions or anything like that, but how do you handle rejection from those shows? Well, yeah, I have. I have tried to apply. I have applied for things. And actually, that was one really good thing that we learned at art school. We wouldn't necessarily learn, but they we were always encouraged to enter every competition mm -hmm. because much of this art thing is about being rejected it's probably be a bit like being an actor you know you go to an audition you, you know not everybody becomes a famous movie star but you just got to keep going so you just keep going and don't worry too much that you've been rejected because most people have been rejected there's only a few people who even the most famous painters in the world would have been rejected <laughs> that's a smart art school you've gone to they seem to have helped you so much i mean they're almost teaching you to accept rejection as the norm so you're not phased by it yeah, that's certainly what I that's certainly what I, I gleaned from it, definitely. You know, it was really good to just, you know, being in London, there's so many art galleries that run competitions and you know, you've got the summer exhibition at the Royal Academy, there's the Mal galleries that run regular competitions and well all over the country really. And I think it's really good to just to work towards something as well, rather than just oh going into your art studio and just painting for the sake of painting, but actually working towards something. So okay. I know there's this deadline for this particular competition. Let's work towards that. Yeah, that's a good piece of advice. Here we go. One just came in. Apart from uh, Milton Avery, which painters inspire you the most? Yeah, Milton Avery, that was a really good exhibition. Well, there's a couple of Canadian artists, actually, because I was in Canada in in May. Emily Carr. I really love her work. I love her colours. I really liked David Milne. I saw an exhibition of his at the Dulwich uh, Picture Gallery a few years ago, loved his work. I think probably at the top of my list is a British artist, she's no longer alive, called Joan Erdley. She was English, but spent most of her time in Scotland and she painted really wild Scottish landscapes and they were just, they are really beautiful. 
So she's she's at the top of my list, I think. Now, kind of a polar opposite question here, though. Um, from when you started to paint and then to when you finally saw your style being established, how much has it changed since then? How much has my style now changed from when I first started? Yeah, or even halfway through. It's really changed a lot. It's changed because I've become more confident. When I first started painting, you know, back in Amsterdam, I just thought, well, whatever you paint, it's just got to look exactly like the you're painting. Everything has got to look identical. And then I realised when I learned that actually an interesting painting doesn't have to be like a photograph. Actually, a really interesting painting is dynamic and exciting and not necessarily like what you're looking at. So I think now I'm just much more confident. I'm much more confident in my brush strokes, much more confident in colour. I don't have to be a slave to what's in front of me in terms of colour. If I want to make, make the sky pink, I will. So yeah, so, but I'm still learning. I mean, I'm still really, I'm still definitely learning. So I don't know how my style will be in a year or two years. I don't know, but I, I hope I'm going to keep moving forward. This conversation is interesting because I don't have any photos of them, unfortunately, but your commissions of pet portraits, <laughs> although impressionistic, are very different from your landscapes. Now, is that intentional just because you can get the, a better sense of a pet portrait with a more impressional style instead of abstract style? Uh, well, I think that, I mean, I have a dog. I've always had dogs and I love dogs. And I think if I was going to have my dog painted by someone, I'd want it to really look like my dog, not like a dog. So I think it's quite important to get that right. But I like to think that I, I mean, in my old, older pet portraits, they were much tighter, but I've just done one quite recently with these four really quite big dogs on a big one meter uh, size canvas and I, I was looking at it uh, and one of them was really hairy and I was looking at it after I thought well I think I've made it look like a landscape it was just this I don't know it looked like grass or something and I really went to town on the color but I think with if you're painting someone's dog or cat whatever it is it's got to look like their dog or their cat so I am definitely more focused on getting that right and painting what's in front of me. Yeah, that makes more sense. And I think you actually have a few of those photos on Instagram of that commission, correct? I, yeah, I do. Yeah. It was, I really enjoyed doing it. It was really fun. I want to ask you, what's probably the best piece of advice someone's ever given you? Okay, so I was given some advice this summer, actually, by an artist called Bruce Munro, who's a friend, and he is a very successful artist. He's a light installation artist, and he all over the world and he said to me I've got to stop worrying about what people think about my work and just do it for me and don't please people so when I'm doing an exhibition if I'm working towards an exhibition don't think about selling that painting don't paint just to sell it paint because you want to paint it and so much more of me will come out onto the page and I thought that was really really good advice because I know for me, if I if I've got a, an exhibition on the horizon, I'll think right. Well, I've got to paint. I've got to paint this number of paintings, and I've got to sell them to cover my costs and da da da. And actually, you're not really going to paint necessarily something that is really you. So that was yeah. I think that was the best advice I got, and I'm definitely heeding to that. And to moving forward, having said that, though, what's probably and it can't be the same. What's the best piece of advice you can give other painters? I think I'd say the same thing. To oh, come on. <laughs> don't just don't know because it honestly has had such a profound effect on me. And yeah, and just just do it because you love it and be brave. And it's okay to it's okay to change your style as well because I my you know I bounce around and that's okay. I mem I remember thinking a while ago, oh, oh I've got to be this one particular kind of artist because that's what people want and no one will know what kind. And actually, no, I. I don't worry about that. It's, it's okay to, to just play around and do your own thing. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that. And I, and I agree with you. I think when you get to a certain point, you realize you can kind of shift back and forth a little bit in terms of the style. But from my experience, and I don't know if you agree with this, but if you are just say one or two years in and you're kind of not sure what you want to do, so you do realism, you do representational, you do impressionism, you do abstract, that would be a little bit too much, I would think. But if you if you establish yourself on what you love to do and you're just shifting kind of a little bit here and there out of the boundaries of what your current style is, that's a little more acceptable. What, what do you think about that? 
No, no, I think you're right. I think if you're just suddenly, you know, doing, I don't know, collage with a whole lot of stuff and then suddenly you're painting it, that might be a little bit confusing. But if that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. Um, but I think, I mean, maybe my my style has, you know, the boundaries aren't that wide. Maybe I'm, you know, I'm sort of representational and quasi-abstract, but they do kind of inform each other and they're sort of in the same sort of sphere or space. But if, I mean, if you want to be mega famous and mega successful, then maybe you should just paint what you think everybody wants. But if you're just doing it because you love it, then just do what you love, I think. Awesome. So we've pretty much come to the end of the interview. There's no more new questions that come in. So I just want to say thank you very much for everybody who uh, attended, everybody who asked the questions. I really appreciate it. If you want to check out uh, Jessica's work, you can see her at jessicagalefineart.com. And of course, she's on Instagram. Her handle is jess.gale.art. And with us, we are at artfulminds.ca. You can find the community aspect of Artful Minds at community.artfulminds.ca. And of course, a big thank you to Jess yourself i really appreciate you doing this interview it's been fantastic I, i've gotten so many great ideas out of it thank you well thank you thanks for having me i really loved it all right and with that everyone we'll say good night take care everyone bye thank bye -bye. you